Hey everybody. A couple days ago, I put out a video called Evergreen Predictions of Climate Doom. And I'm going to read or respond <laughs> to three responses. The first comes from YouTube itself. Well, I mentioned climate in the title and the algorithms scoured, you know, and they scoured over my video and they, they poured their intense attention onto it for a microsecond. And they've come up with the, uh, the notion that this is probably heretical. So they put this context warning on the video. Context. Climate change. United Nations. Climate change refers to long-term shifts in temperatures and weather patterns mainly caused by human activities, especially the burning of fossil fuels. The officially approved YouTube and United Nations position on climate change is that it is mainly, it is mainly caused by the burning of fossil fuels. Now you know. Careful of heresy. All right, that was all fairly silly. Now to respond to a high quality comment. This comes from Michele Mbembe, who writes, I can't speak for any other, uh, I suppose a little context. Um, this, I guess, is the third video now <laughs> responding to this little throwaway Twitter poll that somebody put up that I responded in. You know, what presents a greater danger to uh, humanity, artificial intelligence or climate change? And most people selected climate change, which is fine. You know, I, I have no problem with somebody thinking that. And I'm not committed to saying that, you know, AI is the bigger threat. I, I hold these opinions lightly. I'm commenting on the behavior of the people in the comments, some of whom felt the need to post in the comments that they not only chose climate change, but that they despise the people who said artificial intelligence. You know, those people are confused. Those people are just not dealing with a full deck. You're, you know. Anyway, I did a video commenting on that poll, which generated some comments. And then I did another video commenting on the comments, uh, which of course generated comments. <laughs> but bottom line up front, TLDR. That previous video wasn't about climate change. It wasn't me advocating a climate change skeptic position. It was me commenting on how people who don't know a lot about science and probably couldn't give you a very detailed description of the carbon cycle have very strong opinions about people who fail to hold the correct scientific opinions. What's a, what's a shorter way to say that? People who don't know a lot about science get really mad about the scientific positions that other people hold or fail to hold. And they do so because that is a form of coalitional signaling in the current moment. And so I did a video called uh, Evergreen Predictions of Climate Doom, just demonstrating that for decades now, since at least the mid-60s, but even before that, uh, people have been making a name for themselves, generating notoriety and, and, you know, accumulating status by making wild predictions about impending, you know, crises and catastrophes that will result from climate change. And mostly right now I'm thinking about a guy named Paul Ehrlich. So I put up this, this image of Paul Ehrlich on the Johnny Carson show. This is Paul Ehrlich talking to Johnny Carson and in 1980. And in the introduction to this segment, Johnny Carson, in introducing Paul Ehrlich, says, this, you know, this next guest first appeared on this program 10 years ago. Now, why is that significant? Because in that previous video, I read a newspaper article from 1967 quoting Paul Ehrlich, saying that there was going to be widespread global famine due to, you know, agricultural shortfalls in 1975, that people in the United States of America would be starving to death because population growth will have outstripped food production by 1975. Here is Paul Ehrlich on Johnny Carson in 1980, five years after that prediction of catastrophic global hunger utterly failed to manifest, He's still such a high-profile celebrity because of his engaging predictions of doom, which, you know, charge the emotions and get people really agitated and fire their imaginations. Five years after that, very specific date came and went, and nothing like what he has predicted came to pass. He is still a big enough celebrity that he is welcomed back onto the Johnny Carson show as a celebrity.
That's what he was, a celebrity. And he got his celebrity through dramatic predictions of doom, some of them having to do with climate change, others having to do with, oh my God, there's too many poor people in the world, they're eating all the food. Paul Ehrlich. <laughs> so anyway, again, these videos are not about climate change. It's not me saying you should adopt a particular position on climate change. It's me saying, hey, look at how people who don't know goddamn shit about science have been crowing about climate change as a way to bludgeon their ideological and cultural opponents over the head. That's the point. So, the Makole Mbembe writes, I can't speak for any other specific predictions of doom, but my understanding of why climate change is dangerous has less to do with myth Fearsonian, etc., predictions of human extinction or destruction of habitability of Earth. As you mentioned, Earth has maintained even higher CO2 concentrations in the past, and more to do with the rate of change that human industrial processes are inducing in that concentration and therefore in the Earth system. In the past, except in the cases of catastrophic volcanic eruptions and asteroid impacts, that kind of thing, the rate of change was much lower and so easier to adapt to. Now, Volcanic activity and large asteroid and comet strikes do not occur on the same frequency. Comet strikes are, you know, and asteroid strikes are much more rare. Volcanic activity is ongoing on the Earth. In fact, if you go and you consult respected scientific academic sources about the carbon cycle, you might hear something like, the primary source of CO2 is outgassing from the Earth's interior at mid-ocean ridges, hotspot volcanoes, and subduction-related volcanic arcs. Outgassing from Earth's interior at mid-ocean ridges, hotspot volcanoes, and subduction-related volcanic arcs? What mumbo-jumbo is that? Fossil fuels. Fossil fuels. Get it right, or your video will be demonetized, son. The Mokele Mbembe continues. Have you read any Kim Stanley Robinson recently? The most recent thing I read from Kim Stanley Robinson was either Aurora, which is about uh, a multi-generation uh, colony ship going to another solar system and discovering that, that you know, colonizing it is beyond their capabilities, and so they come back to Earth, much to the uh, you know, disapproval of the people on Earth. It was either that or it was the Ministry for the Future. I liked Aurora. And, you know, basically, it, these are both ideological novels. Um, and Kim Stanley Robinson is, I would say, over the course of his career, he has been an ideological writer. Uh, and I approve of this, particularly because he's been utopian in his ideology, whereas most science fiction of the last few decades that has really caught on and made a name for itself has been dystopian. You know, it is much easier to imagine a dark future than a bright future, and right now, imagining a bright future is often frowned upon. You know, it, it is often considered escapist or irresponsible, and so I've, I've really respected Kim Stanley Robinson's stick to in envisioning, you know, potentially positive futures. But I guess he relents to pressure eventually. The Ministry for the Future is such a doomer novel, and it is, I mean, it's, it's got some of the Kim Stanley Robinson trademark optimism in it, but it is so doom-laden and so ideological. It is so eye-rollingly preachy that, it, in my mind, it's not really a novel. It doesn't qualify as a novel. And in fact, I, I read um, an essay by Kim Stanley Robinson, or maybe it was an afterword to the book or something, where he said, look, I, I know this isn't really a novel. Uh, I know that this is so freighted with, with messaging that I really should just make it nonfiction, but I don't know how to write nonfiction books. I've been writing novels forever. That's what I know how to do. So I'm going to keep doing it. Even when characters and plot are paper thin compared to the message. So no, I, I, looking back on the ministry for the future, I didn't like it for, you know, the fact that it, it did really disregard all the things that make a good novel into a good novel in, in sake of the message. But then the message itself is pretty heinous. I mean, the message comes down to, look, the only way we're going to solve this is to kill a bunch of people. You know, we've we got to kill the rich people. We've got to kill the people who you know, benefit 
economically from the processes which are continuing to exacerbate climate change. And the government, you know, government agencies, in this case, a, a particular agency known as the Ministry for the Future, needs to collaborate with terrorist groups in order to carry out systematic campaigns of, you know, terrorist attack and execution of key figures. That's, you know, it's not the entirety, you know, of the proposed solution, but that's a big part of it. <laughs> you know, for the the bright-eyed optimist Kim Stanley Robinson to say, yeah, to make this right, we got to start shooting down commercial airlines, you know, we got to start blowing up container ships and we have to start, you know, just executing and assassinating particular individuals. Wow, <laughs> that's quite a turnaround. <laughs> so anyway, our commenter continues, have you read any Kim Stanley Robinson lately? His 2312 has a depiction of a solar system-wide human civilization, which includes a post-climate warning, a post-climate warming Earth, which is both clearly affected and changed from how we know it today, and also still livable, just in different locations and different technologies and populations. So I have not read that one. Uh, I'm open to it. I, as I say, I like Kim Stanley Robinson in general. It's just that when he gets possessed by you know the climate change ideology, he kind of goes off the deep end. I think that gets at an issue with climate change too, the pressure that it adds to everything else in the environmental and geopolitical systems. I suspect you know all that, but it's difficult or impossible to pin any specific event directly on climate change. But broadly, its predictable effects include more water in places that aren't built for it, less water in places that already sorely need it, more wildfires, more heat waves, stronger storms, destabilization of glaciers and ice caps, and ocean acidification. These drive things like mass migration and therefore increased strife between neighboring cities. Increased healthcare costs. Think of the heat wave in France in 2003, but hotter and more often and in more places. Damaged biodiversity, which in addition to being, in my opinion, just a bad thing, can also have unpredictable knock-on effects on things like agriculture and food chains. Damage to infrastructure, electrical systems being unable to reach demand, direct damage to buildings, slash, etc., from flooding or fires, etc., etc., etc. So I'm going to pause there because it's not the end of his, his comment. I assume it's a his. Most of my viewers are male. And say, okay, you're responding to a video where I'm talking about the, the never quenched, the never satisfied desire for predictions of impending catastrophe, often justified by fears of climate change, but you know, other, other carriers also serve this function. It doesn't matter how long these predictions fail to bear the predicted fruit, the hunger for them is undiminished. That's the point of the video. This past paragraph from the commenter, uh, whose name I don't have in front of me right now and who I haven't committed to memory, it, it sounds African, but I don't know, seems to be saying, yeah, but this time it's different. Is that your intention? I, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, that's the read that I get, but I could be misinterpreting you. Maybe this time it is different. My point my larger point, not from any one video, but just in general, the position I hold is that, yeah, climate change will lead to, you know, exacerbating pressures, uh, increasing pressures that are going to cost us time, effort, money, but it's not an event. It's a context in which human civilization is operating at this time and going into the future. But the commenter concludes, Maybe you weren't talking to someone like me in this video. I don't expect climate change to make the Earth uninhabitable, but I also don't expect it to make life easier for pretty much anyone. And in fact, I think it's already making life harder and less predictable for a lot of people. Is it more of a threat than AI? I don't know how to quantify that. They are definitely similar in making life less stable slash predictable, though. So... Who am I talking to? I'm talking to the people who watch these videos, <laughs> you know? As far as I can tell, there's about roughly a hundred of you who pretty much watch any video that I put up regardless of the topic, unless I screw up with the cover art or the, um, 
the title and then Google doesn't even, or YouTube doesn't even show it to you, you don't know that I've put up a new video. But there's about a hundred people who, if they see that I put up a new video, they'll watch it. That's who I'm talking to. Sometimes other people find their way to these videos and hey, welcome. <laughs> but you know, I'm not, I'm not really talking to you specifically. Don't take it personally. I just don't know who you, I don't know that you exist. But the people I was talking about in that original video, you know, sparked by the Twitter poll, they're not the sort of people who, in response to, you know, asking which is a bigger threat to humanity, AI or climate change, post a comment saying, oh, I don't know how to quantify that. Those are very different sorts of things. The people I'm talking about are the ones who clicked climate change, but that wasn't enough. They then had to denounce anybody who would click AI. That's the people I'm, those are the people I'm talking about. Who am I talking to? I'm, I'm talking to you. Michele, the Michele Mbembe, I think, if I got it right. Paul noticed that I got a haircut. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Albert Bates, who very generously hosted me in residence at the Eco Village Training Center for two years and paid me a stipend to just be there and do podcasts, uh, posted to the Why I Stopped Being a Doomer video, I was in it for the Doomer humor. <laughs> Excellent comment. And thanks again to Albert Bates, one of the most generous supporters of the KMO project in existence. Okay, this was not meant to be another one of those half hour videos, but it's gonna be. <laughs> so, Ben a rubber, congratulations, do the dishes and uh, know that this thing is just gonna ramble on and on. This will be the last comment that I respond to though. M. F. Giovanna writes, I think the main thing with climatic, he, she, I'm guessing he wrote climactic, but that's a mistake I always make. Climactic means at the climax. Climatic means of the climate or <laughs> relating to the climate. I often say climactic when I mean climatic. So M. F. Giovanna writes, I think that the main thing with climactic and population references is that they are made on a human timescale assumption, more often than not, rather than a geological timescale assumption. Yeah, I was born in 1985. I don't give a crap that there's 7 billion or more people on Earth, nor that the CO2 reading on the Keeling curve is 415.83 parts per million today. It doesn't cause any hindrance to me physically. But even like two, for instance, human lifetimes from now, population and climate related stuff may be a much bigger deal to them folks, let alone 20 human lifetimes from now or 2000. No one cares at all, but no one cares at all even that far into the future. Okay, so I wish I was inside so I could say, uh, Alexa, what's 2000 times and, and what's a generation? Like 30 years? It's 30 years a generation? What's 2000 times 30? 60,000? Here's the key part of this feedback though let alone 20 human lifetimes from now or 2000. No one cares at all that far into the future, but those future people will surely look back at how we lived and hate us, most likely. How couldn't they? Okay, I'm gonna stop there. I mean, that's the part I wanted to get to. You think that people 2000 generations from now, tens of thousands of years from now, are going to look back at us specifically People making videos and watching videos in, you know, industrialized, globalized civilization in the year 2022, us specifically, and hate us for how we lived. Do you hate the people who lived 40,000 years ago for how they lived? You probably have the vaguest, you, you probably have a category of people called prehistoric. And they're all pretty much identical. They're all just one big lump of, you know, abstraction in your mind. Do you hate them? I mean, you don't know them. How could you hate them? <laughs> let's, let's, you know, I mean, tens of thousands of years, it's, it's way too big. It's way too much for even, you know, to get a handle on. So let's say 2,000 years. Let's say the year AD 22. Roman, Roman Empire, or the Roman civilization. The Roman civilization lasted for a thousand years. When you think of the Romans as a category of people, do you hate them? And how many 
subcategories do you have in your mind under the Romans? Well, you should have at least two, Roman Republic and Roman Empire, okay? Uh, within Roman Empire, you should have pagan Rome and Christian. So there's, there's six. You can multiply that by two because, you know, in any of those periods, there were the rich elites and there were the commoners, you know, so the, uh, the equestrians or the plebs. But, you know, for a thousand years, what is that, 12? 12 categories of people that, you know, honestly, could you have come up with 12 before I guided you through that division? Um, you know, the Romans. There's a thousand years worth of people, millions of people, all in this one little concept. I mean, who is the Roman emperor in AD 22? Do you know? I mean, I know because I looked it up, but I couldn't have told you. It's Tiberius, by the way. Um, the idea that people thousands, tens of thousands of years in the future are going to look back at us, us in particular, at this moment, that they're going to have a concept of us, a very specific concept of the people living in industrialized dem democratic societies who could have voted blue and didn't. That is the height of self-absorption and hubris. They're going to have one to the extent that they feel hatred, they're going to do like we do. They're going to save it for their contemporary opponents. They're going to save it for the people in the other tribe. Those are the people they're going to hate 30, 40, 60,000 years from now. They're not going to hate us. They're going to hate their contemporaries if they're like us. Maybe, and this is quite a stretch, but maybe they'll be a bit more, I hate to say evolved, but, you know, a, a bit more emotionally and ethically sophisticated than we are and they'll recognize hatred for what it is, you know, a, a net negative, something to be eliminated. When you spot it in yourself, there are, there are even today, methodologies for uh, quelling that stuff. If you don't take advantage of them, well, it's your choice. <laughs> it's helpful, I'm telling you, it's helpful. So one, no. They're not even going to have a conception of us. And two, to the extent that they do have a conception of us, it's going to be such a broad, it's going to be like our prehistoric peoples. You know, we don't have a concept of, or at least I don't, you know, I'm not an anthropologist. I'm not a uh, paleontologist. I, I, you know, I'm interested in these fields, but I don't study them. Uh, I don't have a notion of who was living on this spot 40,000 years ago. I mean, generally, Native Americans. But even then, I mean, were they even here 40,000 years ago? I'm not sure. If they were, I think they were newly arrived, but maybe they weren't even here. Maybe there were no humans living here. But if there were, I have no conception of them. That's likely the conception of you and me that people 60,000 years from now are going to have, particularly non-specialists, particularly just everyday normal people doing their business. You think they're going to hate us because they're going to think about how their lives would be different if we had behaved differently? I mean, the Mongols existed way less than 2,000 years ago, less than 1,000 years ago. It was, you know, the Mongol breakout and, and takeover. Um, they did enormous damage, killed millions of people, just straight up murdered civilian populations. Do you hate the Mongols? I don't hate the Mongols. Their, you know, their actions were demonstrably evil and had enormous knock-on effects. I mean, look at how many people are genetically related to Genghis Khan, you know? Do I hate Genghis Khan? No, I don't hate Genghis Khan. He's a guy who lived hundreds of years ago. I, I don't know him. How could I hate him? So, of all the categories of past people that I've just named, do you, do you feel visceral, emotional hatred for them? If not, why do you think that people in the future are going to hate you? They're not going to have any notion of you. They're not going to hate you. They're not going to hate me. <laughs> you know, unless they're omniscient AI that has absorbed all of the internet, which somehow, you know, didn't collapse and uh, didn't get overwritten and wasn't written with broken links and, you know, didn't degrade over time. Uh, you know, that it's all perfectly preserved in a way that, you know, the internet of 10 years ago is not preserved now. <laughs> if somehow they have access to all that and they've seen all my videos and all videos and can bring it all into their head and, you know, their, their head, you know, accommodated all in their active consciousness and, you know, have this, this ongoing 
not only knowledge of it, but moral uh, opinion, you know, a, a moral appraisement of us. And they, they judge us as so evil, so... What's Hillary Clinton's uh, phrase? Um, so deplorable <laughs> that they deserve, that, that we deserve their visceral anger and hatred from tens of thousands of years in the future. I mean, come on. Hate. You, you, you see no reason why people living tens of thousands of years from now won't look back at this particular moment in time and feel hatred for us. Just think about that. <laughs> think about how important that makes us in this moment, in this context, for making the choices that we did. Because we didn't create the world that we live in. We didn't choose where to be born, what time to be born in, who, who our parents should be. You know, I may drive a car, but I didn't choose to exist in car culture. Car culture is where I live. What are my real, I mean, what's my high leverage point in affecting climate change in the far, far future? What lever do I have access to that I'm not, you know, pushing against with all my might that I should be in order to avoid the justified hatred of people living 40,000 years from now? I mean, come on. <laughs> I know I've picked on you a lot for what you probably think of was an offhand comment, but come on. Who do you hate? Who do you really, really hate? It's not somebody from 40,000 years ago. <laughs> anyway. Sorry, um, what was it? Sorry, MF Giovanna. I don't know you personally, so don't take it personally. I'm responding to the words that you posted and the ideas that I think you meant to convey with them. And I realize I could be wrong about that. So don't take it personally. All right, everybody else, like the video. I, I don't care. I, I honestly don't care if you like the video or not. Uh, I will talk to you again soon. Take care.